Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, my name is Keen Fitzgerald. In, in my day job, I am the IAA security and defense researcher. And I've recently taken over to, uh, chairing the IAA's Young Professionals Network, which is something that I'm very proud to do. And I'd actually, I'd like to, because he's in the audience tonight, I'd like to thank my predecessor, Dara Lawler, who spent many tireless hours trying to put together this wonderful initiative. And the reason that we have so many people in this room right now, I think a lot of that can be attributed to Dara's hard work over, the, over his tenure of that. So I'd like to say thank you very much in a little appropriate way. And um, now to business. Um, so um, today, we're going to, today we're delighted to be joined by Nicholas Kralev, the Executive Director of the Washington International Diplomatic Academy, where we're going to be discussing US diplomacy in the 2024 presidential election. Um, Nicholas Kralev is a recognized expert in US diplomacy, international affairs, and foreign service training. He, uh, as mentioned earlier, he's the founding Executive Director of the Washington International Diplomatic Academy an independent organization which offers professional training in diplomacy. With over two decades of experience, Nicholas Kralev has closely observed US diplomacy, first as a correspondent for, correspondent for the Financial Times and the Washington Times, traveling with Secretaries of State Hillary Clinton, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, and Madeleine Albright. He's also, also authored several books, including America's Other Army and Diplomatic Tradecraft, which was recently published by Cambridge University Press. So what I was thinking that the order of tonight's event would be that perhaps Nicholas and I would speak for about 10 minutes, touch on aspects of Nicholas's career, what he thinks we can expect from US diplomacy from, from next week, um, and then we might open it up to the audience. Um, so previously, what I wanted to ask you just to begin with is as we are looking to the, as we are looking to the ele election next week, and you've written pretty extensively on the on what you termed the, the, the dark ages caused in US diplomacy caused by Donald Trump. And what I was wondering is, thinking a little bit about what, if there is to be a Trump presidency to come from next week, what would you think implications you think it might have for US diplomacy? I'm starting with a hard well, question early on. <laughs> um, well, it's not a hard question. It's just that you know, we have to speculate. And it's only four days away. Can we just wait and see what happens? <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for hosting me and to all of you for coming on a Friday evening. I'm sure there was a more amusing thing to do tonight, but maybe you did it last night. OK, so the Dark Ages, was that in the New York Times I wrote? It was, yes. yeah. OK. It's been You spoke of Renaissance, years. in all fairness. Uh, that's right. Post-Trump Renaissance in diplomacy. Has it happened? <laughs> You know, I sometimes take a few seconds to think, um, and I'm reminded of the, the day Trump gave a press conference with Vladimir Putin in Helsinki in 2018. I was speaking at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, and someone asked what I thought about the performance of the press conference. And I took a few seconds to think before I formulated an answer, and after the event, one of the Smithsonian people said that she was sitting next to two ladies in the audience in the last row. And one turned to her friend and say, oh my God, this guy thinks before he speaks. So I try to emulate myself and think before I speak. Uh, not only because this is uh, on the record, but uh, because again, we're four days away from the election. We hope there'll be a result, but there may not be a result immediately. We may not have a result for days, if not longer, as has happened in the past. <clears throat> so uh, I've been asked frequently in the last four weeks as I go around various European countries, sometimes five or six countries in one week, which is insane, I admit, but I did it, so I won't repeat it. Uh, people ask me about um, how Trump might change US diplomacy, US foreign policy, more frequently, actually. And then some people ask me how either one, either candidate, might change foreign policy and diplomacy. To me, there are two levels to this question. The first one is the policy, and the, the second is diplomacy, right? Because diplomacy and foreign policy are not the same thing. Many people um, use the two terms interchangeably, but that's inaccurate, because 
diplomacy is just one tool in the toolbox of foreign policy, one tool of implementing foreign policy. The others, of course, are the military, the intelligence or spycraft. These three have been the, historically the, the, the core tools. And of course, today we have trade and investment and cultural diplomacy and uh, health and science diplomacy and, and assistance, foreign assistance and development and all that. On the policy level, diplomats implement policy made by policymakers at headquarters or in the capital, in our case, in Washington. So there is um, no question, given Trump's record in the first term and what he and his people have been saying during the campaign, that they don't much care about what the rest of the world thinks about the United States and particularly how they feel about multilateralism. Uh, multilateralism is one of those words that Madeleine Albright used to say uh, Americans don't like because, first of all, it's just too long and it, e and it ends with an ism. <laughs> and that's the problem uh, because uh, the, communism ends with an ism and words like this and supposedly Americans don't like them. Uh, I don't think most Americans th have ever thought about multilateralism and what it means. Uh, but the bottom line here is how one sees the world, how the president sees the world. And I don't think, like many politicians, I don't think Trump understands why diplomacy is not just important to sort of keep the peace, but also important for statecraft. Now, statecraft is not in his vocabulary, but when you are the president of the United States, you are engaged in statecraft because you are the statesman even if you don't deserve it. So what I mean is if a president or a prime minister or any head of state or government, if they know how to use diplomacy effectively as a tool of foreign policy, they can benefit their own policies and the implementation of those policies, right? You can write the best policy paper, you can come up with the best policy you can think of, but unless your diplomats are there to implement it, what good does it do? And uh, as we saw in the first term, Trump does not think highly of diplomats. Um, so um, m many of them I mean, uh, uh, left the State Department when he uh, was in office last time Many, but not as many as people think. Right? Most of them stayed in. And they tried their best, even if they disagreed with the policies, they tried their best to do their job because they thought that without them it would be even worse. I think many more now would leave. And I worry about the continuity of US diplomacy if that happens. And the other thing I worry about is funding. Last time, he cut the State Department budget significantly, and this time it'll be even worse. They've said that on the record, so there is no question. Now, this, of course, depends on the Congress, right? If, if the Congress is democratic, that would be difficult to do, meaning to cut any kind of budget. If the, the Congress is Republican, then, of course, it'll be easier. They can do whatever he wants. If the Congress is mixed, meaning one House Republican, the other Democratic, there'll be more hurdles and potentially um, he, he would have trouble uh, implementing some of his agenda because at the end of the day for things like the budget, you need both houses to agree to um, whatever the proposal is in the legislation. Uh, so I, you know, I, I never, I was never political. I never said publicly who I'd vote for. I really never got involved in criticizing one party uh, or another. Um, in this case, when I wrote this piece in the New York Times about a uh, post-Trump, well, I was hoping for a post-Trump uh, renaissance in diplomacy, and I was talking about the sort of a dark age for US diplomacy. Um, it was done not because he rep was the Republican candidate, or whether, although I, I don't think he is a Republican if you look at what he believes in. But anyway, so it wasn't, it, I, mean, I, I wasn't trying to be political. I was, just, I was just analyzing what he was doing and what he was saying 
Um, and I was only looking at the impact of that on the US national interest and the US role in the world. So I just want to be clear that I don't get involved in US domestic politics. Um, I'm just uh, looking at um, uh, the, the, po the, the policies and the, their implementation. What I was hoping to maybe touch on before I then go to the floor, because uh, I don't want to monopolize Mr. Kralov's time, who's Mr. Kralov's time, but um, speaking about the, the other side of the coin, you, you followed so many senior, uh, senior US, US diplomats. You've spent, you, you spent a great part of your tr career traveling around. And though I know I'm asking you somewhat to speculate, but we, we, we read speculations about what Kamala Harris's foreign policy might look like. Uh, it, you know, the speculation that it might be slightly less proactive than, than Biden's. Often others speculate that it will remain largely the same. But what I'm, I'm maybe asking that you might be able to touch on just from what you've seen, from your extensive experience, what might uh, diplomacy look like under Kamala Harris? I think there are many unknowns at this point. Um, she has experience as vice president, but it's been in the service of Biden's agenda, right? She didn't have the, her own agenda, as should be. The vice president is not supposed to drive policy or to determine policy. So what happens in real life when a, someone gets elected president, first of all, their immediate focus is on domestic issues. That was the case with Obama, with healthcare and the financial crisis. That was the case with Bill Clinton all the way back in the Middle Ages. For you, I mean, I was born, you weren't uh, born yet at the time. And um, if the president, well, the president has to pay attention to foreign policy because just the world goes on and things need to be done. Um, it's a few hot spots, right? It's the Middle East. I mean, right now it's the Middle East and Ukraine. That's it. So I don't expect her to have time for much else at the beginning, let's say in the first three to six months. So I don't think she would undertake any reforms to the, the system, to the diplomacy system we have, uh, which I think is in bad need of reform, but I, she just won't have time to do it or to focus on it. Uh, now, in terms of proactive or all that, Biden had so much experience in foreign affairs before he became president, right? Not only had he been vice president, he had been a senator for 30 years, including chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So he had pretty much an opinion about everything. That is, we, we don't know that that's necessarily the case with her. We know some basic contours about what she believes in based on the, the, what she has said in public. Now, she has spoken mostly about domestic issues during the campaign. She has spoken about the, uh, uh, the war in Gaza and now Lebanon, but she has had difficulty not only explaining um, she has had difficulty the way Biden and everybody around him has had in terms of trying to figure out how to protect American interests in a region where there's also the Israeli interest, right? That's very tricky in diplomacy because even with your best allies, like Britain and Ireland and Canada and Australia and so on, and Israel, even with your best allies, sometimes your interests don't fully overlap, right? And that's what the White House has been grappling with in the past several months, in particular the past several weeks. On one hand, they don't want to go against Israel in public, on the other hand, in private, both the president and his staff have been trying to get the Israelis to show some restraint, right? To care more about civilian casualties. Um, even to think about a Palestinian state, which Netanyahu has refused to do. 
So it's, this, this is all, you know, downstairs we were talking about diplomacy and skills and diplomacy and all that. This is one of the hardest skills in diplomacy. How do you protect your national interest while also respecting the national interest of the other country, in this case, an ally, and how not to get dragged into conflicts um, that you think is not worth getting involved in. Um, it's very complicated, um, and I think that in this case, we've seen some of the weaknesses of US diplomacy. And policy, by the way, I mean, this is not just diplomacy. You know, if you, if you don't have a good policy to implement, then it's not, the, it's not diplomacy's fault. It's like, the, you know, the, I, I don't know if any, I mean, you, you were too young to remember uh, if, uh, even the Iraq war of, that started in 2003, but American diplomats had to ex not just explain, but also defend the decision to go to war around in various countries, including in this country. And um, they took it seriously. They did their best. But it was the policy that was the problem, right? You, there was no way that you could explain away start you know, invading another country. And now, every, I mean, most people are now in Washington, whether Republican or Democrat, realize that it was a mistake to, to do that, to, do the, you know, to go to war, particularly because the main stated reason for the war, which, you know, the, the existence supposed of, of weapons of mass destruction turned out to be false. Um, so by now, we, pretty much everyone agrees, everyone who knows something about foreign affairs agrees that it was a mistake. But the point is that um, at the time, uh, many people focused on winning the hearts and minds of the people in the Middle East. And one, I was at the time doing research for my, uh, one of my earlier books, America's Other Army, which is on the US Foreign Service. That's when I started my research. And um, one uh, diplomat at the embassy in Oslo said, um, it doesn't matter how you package the policy, if it stinks, It'll always stink. He, he had been a marketing executive before he became a diplomat, so he, he uh, compared it to a, um, a carton of, of rotten milk, um, right? It doesn't matter how you market this carton of milk, it's rotten. <laughs> and it won't improve just because you're going to put a nice ribbon on it or present it in a certain way. Um, so, yeah, in this case, uh, it just, this has been the case in the Middle East for decades. It just doesn't matter how, well, it does matter how, how skillful your diplomacy is, but often it's not the diplomacy that's the problem, it's the policy you're trying to implement. So what I was thinking that we might do is we might open this now up to the audience, uh, but just could I possibly get a show of hands as to who would like to ask a question just so I can establish whether I need to bunch questions or if we have time to... Great, okay. The, the, uh, let me, just to make things sort of easy for you, maybe a bit more, uh, a, a bit clearer. So I came to the field of diplomacy through journalism, as you heard, um, and my job was to cover the State Department, which means US diplomacy on a daily basis. And part of it was accompanying the US Secretary of State as they traveled around the world. Um, I've been to 107 countries, but not to all of them with the Secretary of State. Sometimes I go without them. <laughs> Um, and I visited about 88 US embassies during my research. Um, I uh, founded the uh, Diplomatic Academy in Washington because there, there had never been an, an institution or an organization outside a government that provided practical training in diplomacy. And if, if you wanted to b join the Foreign Service, if you wanted to become a career diplomat, there wasn't really any place where you can get a realistic picture of what you would be asked to do, uh, or the, what skills uh, specifically, not just, oh, good communicator or this and that, but specifically, what would you do on a daily basis working in an embassy or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or whatever it is. Um, that's why I started the Academy, because when the State Department or ministries uh, want to recruit new diplomats, they're asking you to commit to a career, but they're not telling you exactly what you should expect in a career. Um, so people jump in almost blindly, and some of them in the first couple of years figure out, oh, that, that's not for me. So I'd rather have people figure this out before they join, because that's, first of all, they're wasting their time, and they're also wasting taxpayers' money, 
because every time they're posted to an embassy, or you know, that, that costs money, right? Uh, and um, I, I'm also now trying, I, this new book, uh, Diplomatic Tradecraft, is essentially what, what we've been teaching for seven years, but in a book form. So I'm hoping that universities will start using this book to teach courses on, diplo on the diplomatic practice, because I think that academia can play a role in preparing the next generation of diplomats. So we don't have to wait until they join the ministry to then train them, uh, but people who, uh, particularly at the, at the postgraduate level, but why not in the, and even uh, undergraduate, to, because uh, all, all it would take is take one course, for example, based on the book, uh, and by the end of it, I'm sure that anyone would know whether diplomacy is a career they'd like to pursue. Um, it just saves time to everyone. Um, it, I'm, I try to be practical and, and pragmatic, um, which is why, uh, from the very beginning, I decided that we wouldn't teach international relations. That's Many universities teach that, so if one wants to learn that, they can go and get a degree there. We would teach tradecraft. Specific, what we call trade. The, the, uh, the, the tra tradecraft is a set of uh, skills, duties, and responsibilities in the modern, in the daily conduct of modern diplomacy. Uh, and the other decision we made was that only practitioners will teach. So only career ambassadors, former career ambassadors with 30 to 40 years of experience, would teach based on what they learned during those years. So anyway, so this is the base. I'm, I'm just saying this so when you ask your questions, you. Uh, don't have uh, unrealistic expectations because I don't speak for the American government. I've never worked for the American government. I doubt I will ever work for it, but I'm, I, I was given such unprecedented access to the system to do my research and then um, work with um, various people um, on the, from the career part of the, um, of the State Department, but also many political appointees. So, yes, let's go on to the questions. Yeah. Let's see the hands again. So we might start with Mark at the front and then that gentleman in the second row there. Um, th <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much for the talk. I'd just like to touch on something you mentioned in the answer to the second question around, you know, how the US am administration at the moment is grappling with the Middle East. Um, classic question to be asking right now. Um, so you mentioned, you know, about the difference between public and private. They don't want to criticize Israel in public, but in private they're trying to do certain things. For many people, though, outside of that world, they are only seeing the public, obviously. They are seeing and criticizing the U.S. regarding, you know, continuing to sell arms to Israel and provide um, military aid and so on. And I'm wondering to what extent this impacts on, I suppose, legitimacy of American diplomacy. So, say, taking a country like South Africa, who are obviously involved in the ICJ case, um, what extent this reduces maybe, I suppose, American influence or credibility, or does it at all because, for other reasons, it might be there? And I'd just be very curious on your opinion there. I, is it related or is it a con unrelated? Un okay, so let me, let me then, um, yeah, I, I, I may forget the first one by the time of the second one. I remember what I did in 1982, but I, uh, oh no, 80, sorry, I was eight in 82, nay, uh, maybe 92. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, of course it does. Uh, I, I, uh, I mean, there's no way to, to lie to ourselves, right? Um, or to bury our heads in the sand and hope for the best. Um, now again, this is mostly to do with policy and policy making. However, I do think that in the last 20 years, higher diplomacy skill could have helped in terms of the relationship between the United States and Israel. Um, it doesn't seem to me that the Israeli prime minister cares at all about what the White House wants or says or does, right? That given that in, the, in this, relation, or this, this um, uh, relationship of allies, the United States is the bigger and, and uh, at least uh, theoretically more powerful partner, it seems to me the balance is a bit off, right? And so this could have been more adjusted um, to the benefit of the United States with perhaps more skillful diplomacy. Um, I, 
I'm not sure how realistic it is to think that maybe this could be rebalanced even in a Harris administration. Um, it could if the president wanted it. I think this is a presidential level thing that does happen. It's, at this point, I think it's, it's not in the diplomat's hands. I think it's way off that level. But um, it's, it has to be a political decision. There is no way uh, around it. Uh, or you ha you, the other option is to wait for another prime minister in Israel and recalibrate. Right? But given the lessons under this prime minister, I would not be surprised if whoever the next prime minister is um, tries to maintain the current state of the relationship because in many ways um, it is in, Israel, in, in Israel's interest to do that. Great. And this gentleman over here. Um, uh, you said you'd been to 80, over 80 embassies. Uh, was I'm, I'm so sorry. If you wouldn't mind just telling us your name and oh, if yeah. you have an affiliation, that would also be great. Um, What would, what would you rate as like uh, your favorite embassy? Like what are the top ones, would you say? Oh, this, wow, this is very, um, uh, I'm just so surprised that no one has ever asked me that question. Of course, people ask me all the time, my favorite country, favorite city, whatever, but nobody's asked me favorite embassy because could anyone have a favorite embassy? I don't. Um, Well, people at embassies come and go, right? The diplomats come and go. The local staff remains, of course, but you're not asking about local staff, um, I assume. So um, I assume you're also not asking about the building, or you're asking about the, the what happens in the embassy? Or, I mean, there, I could talk about, you know, a favorite building of an embassy, or I could talk about the substance or the what happens in the, in the embassy. Oh, the building, okay. Ah, okay, that's easier. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, because I thought you were asking about the quality of diplomats or... Um, <laughs> that would be juicier maybe, but... Uh, yeah, well, that's why I said they come and go. They rotate every three years or less, right? So, it, yeah, that, that will be impossible to answer. Well, the U.S. embassies that have been built in the last couple of decades are not very beautiful uh, buildings because they built them with one single purpose and that resulted from the 1998 embassy bombings in Africa. Uh, Kenya and Tanzania in, in August 7 of 98. And since then they've been, they've been building them uh, according to certain standards, which means that they can't really be very nice looking buildings. Uh, the security was paramount rather than. So there, there are quite a few embassies that look very similar, if not the same, in various countries. However, the, um, uh, now the, the nicer buildings are ambassador residences. So for example, the one in Paris, uh, the one in Tokyo is kind of unusual on the outside, but it's very nice on the inside. Um, the one in London is very nice. I haven't seen the one here. Uh, now, that said, the new embassy in London, which, where I was on Monday, I guess, um, is probably the most impressive architecturally because it's so unusual. Right, there's this round building. I mean, you, have you seen it on? You can just Google it and you'll see. It's, it's a very unusual. I would never have guessed that this is an embassy. And then it, the, the way it was built inside is also unusual. There are many parts where uh, that, that you would not find in other embassies. Uh, there are there's a pub. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of embassies where the, you know with pubs. So the the, yeah, the U.S. embassy in Paris has a pub, but it's um, very different because it you know it's a very old building. This one was done sort of in a modern way. Uh, it was. Um, it looks like more the headquarters of an international organization than, than an embassy, the embassy of a country. Uh, I am not sure whether they do tours. They might. So if, if you're interested, next time you're in London, see if they might do to, they, they might, because they're, 
there are areas that where you might be able to go um, without interfering with, I mean, um, uh, with the work of the embassy. It's, it's so big, I mean, I mean it's, tall, it's a tall building. Uh, most embassies are not very big and they often are forced to add annexes and things. But this one, because it was just opened, what was it, in 2018 or something, uh, or, is that, I think that, I think it's 2018. Anyway, it could be more recently, but I think that was it. That was the first time I, I'd seen it. I'd been to the old embassy uh, several times before, but uh, this one, uh, and this was actually opened by a political ambassador appointed by Trump. Um, yes, so it, it, if it was 2018, that, that's, that was during the uh, Trump administration. If, if more embassies had pubs in them, maybe it'd be easier to bring people into the diplomatic service. <laughs> well, here is the problem with that. Just, pra again, pragmatically. Because of security measures, it's not easy to do much in an embassy with people from the host country. So even if you invite some person from the ministry or the Department of Foreign Affairs here or some, you know, big short um, dean at some or rector of a university, they still have to go through security. And many people don't want to do that because they think, oh, I, you know, I've worked all my life. I, you know, I've achieved this high position. I'm not going to go through some, you know, I have to take off my belt. That's demeaning, right? So the, we have problems getting people to come to an embassy. You, you probably think you could, who, who wouldn't want to uh, but then the other problem is that many of the embassies now are built outside the center of a city for security reasons. And so people would rather not drive to, you know, half an hour to sit and sit in traffic, right? This means, again, pragmatically, that it's the Americans who will have to go somewhere else to meet the people from the host country. Uh, now, the, um, the prospect of free beer or other drinks at the pub at the embassy may be uh, appealing, right, uh, to some people, but it um, doesn't happen very often that uh, non-Americans or people who don't work at the embassy uh, would go there. It happens very rarely. So, but again, maybe, maybe the prospect of free alcohol may be enough to, uh, to entice people to um, come in. Anyway, yes. <laughs> So I think I see another question just over there at the back. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name's Kira. I'm here in my personal capacity. But um, as you know, a diplomat can be posted abroad not only bilaterally, but to intergovernmental or multilateral organizations. So my question to you is, what is your assessment of US diplomats' ability and capacity for coalition building in intergovernmental or multilateral organizations? Thank you. Uh, not bad. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, I, I don't think enough, but we have several diplomats who focused on multilateral diplomacy for most of their career. In fact, two of them wrote or drafted the chapter on multilateralism, more, more multilateral diplomacy in my book. Uh, and they very systematically go through the, not only the skills, but also um, specifically how you accomplish certain tasks at the UN, because their, their experience is at the UN. So they have examples from their own work and experience. Uh, and I think it's a very, very, it's very good education for anyone who wants to practice multilateral diplomacy. Uh, unfortunately, most career diplomats focus more on bilateral rather than so I, I, in any country's foreign service, so, well, I'll generalize now, but uh, maybe with some, well, with the exception perhaps on, uh, uh, of um, members of the EU, because you have to put up now with, how many are now, 27? How many, I know NATO is 31 or 32, right? But what is, what is EU is 27. 27. 27 after Brexit, okay. 
Um, so, in other words, uh, it's very difficult for an Irish diplomat or any, any diplomat from an EU member state uh, to ignore multilateral diplomacy. It's just now in the fabric, right? Because uh, you have all these other, um, I mean, you've, you've, there is the European external action, so there's the European, in the, there is the EU foreign service in addition to the national foreign services of all the member states. So it's, but anyway, but that aside, uh, traditionally there's been a bigger focus on bilateral diplomacy uh, than on multilateral. Uh, now, we also have the international civil servants at the UN, at, at NATO, and at the EU, right? These are the people who don't represent any particular country's interests, but they're supposed to represent the interests of the entire organization. Right? They're also diplomats in a way, um, but they are international civil servants. They get paid by the organization or by a government. Coalition building is sometimes looked at in a very narrow perspective, I think, um, and maybe too literally, in other words, when you, lit when you literally need a coalition of countries, right? Uh, for example, when the Iraq war was starting in 2003, the United States was looking for a coalition of the willing, as they call it, right? And Britain joined, and some other countries joined. Now, this is war, not diplomacy, but it was diplomacy before the war started to get some resolution passed, passed in the UN. So this is the literal coalition building. But every day in the UN, the work includes coalition building. Because this may have to do with the Security Council resolution or General Assembly resolution. So when all the resolutions in 2022 were passed by the General Assembly condemning Russia, every one of them had to be negotiated. And this is not, uh, the Security Council may be easier because there's only 15 members the General Assembly has 193, right? So this is not literal coalition building because it's only in support of a document which doesn't even have the power of law, right? But absolutely every day, um, it's, uh, the work at the UN involves coalition building. Yeah. I see right. a question beside Kira. Yes, just... Hi, my name's Aoife, and I'm just, like you said, uh, not affiliated around the thing. Um, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this question, just kind of quickly. Um, I suppose when, uh, and it's in the area of diplomacy again, when working with Americans, would you have any advice, um, maybe in terms of the American negotiation style or just relationship building? Um, I've never actually been to America. I have one or two American friends, but if there's anything you observed, um, I suppose when you were in all the embassies, as you mentioned, any particular thing that was kind of general, um, or maybe is maybe it's just an individual kind of thing. But if you have any thoughts on that, thank you. I think it would be too simplistic trying to answer this here and now because, first of all. You know, we don't have the time. Second of all, it'll be just look too superficial, and I can't generalize it, but I can address some stereotypes um, that may have some validity to them, but maybe not. Uh, so the perception out there is that the Americans are transactional, which of course is embodied by Trump, but, but it's, you know, it, it preceded him by decades. So he, that, for that, I don't blame him. Just for that. Um. <laughs> and the other perception was that um, they, they're too, um, Practical is too nice of a word, um, but you know, um, just um, what's a better way to put this without 
judging too much, just because I'm trying to just uh, tell you what I've heard, right, as, as uh, perceptions and stereotypes. Um, the, they don't want to invest too much or spend too much time, right, that they, they're looking for quick results, that they don't invest enough in building relationships, which is connected with transactional, because transactional is exactly the opposite of uh, long-term relationship building, right? And the other part of the stereotype had to do with expecting other countries to just salute and follow, right? I don't think any of these stereotypes is completely correct. There might have been examples of some of these over the, the decades. But, um, so I've been um, sort of involved more closely in the last 20 years. Before that, I, I, I have some memories and I've, I know people, I mean, Madeleine Albright, I, you know, I traveled with her at the very end in 2000, and she'd already been secretary for four years. Um, I wasn't there for the, until the very end, just you know, literally three months before she left. Uh, although you know, I, I know a lot, but um, the, the stature of the United States in the 90s was very different. Unfortunately, after 9-11, after the terrorist attacks on, on September 11, things changed dramatically. And I think the United States and US diplomacy in particular lost a lot of its previous sway, influence, power, whatever you call it. Um, so that the response to 9-11, including the war in Iraq, did a lot of damage to the stature of the country and, and US diplomacy in particular. Uh, so this is to say um, that American diplomats are trying to be more professional in approaching negotiations. And there is, we have a whole chapter of, the, of this in the book and the last chapter um, with very specific advice on how one prepares for a negotiation. Which rely, which, and one of the main points is do not rely on the power or image of your country. Don't assume that just because you are the United States, people will just line up and do what you want, right? And the other thing, don't expect that, that country, other countries will do you favors. Right. They will agree to something because they are afraid of you or because um, you may give them more money if they agree or whatever the case may be, right? Um, so one of the, well, I think the most difficult things in diplomacy to achieve is to align another country, align or realign another country's interests with that of your own government. Not as a favor to you, but because you persuade them that it's in their own interest, right? And that is based on empathy. That's why I think em em empathy is the most important skill in diplomacy. Um, I think um, the basis of diplomacy is empathy for the views of others. N not sympathy, but empathy, right? You don't have to agree with the other side, but, and this is sort of the height of professionalism and mastery, in order to move the other side, what, what are negotiations for, right? They are either to resolve a conflict or a dispute or to change another country's policies, right? The negotiations that happen every day at embassy, uh, in the capitals between uh, d d career diplomats and governments are not about war and peace. These are done at the minister's levels in the heads of state, right? These are much more sort of everyday type negotiations and that have to do with managing the relationship. And often they are about policy, in other words, uh, let's say Ireland has enacted a policy that the Americans have decided that it's not in, in the American interest. Th and this almost never happens in this country because, because of, you know, it's an ally, but um, there, you know, there are many countries that are either adversaries or just uh, not, not, not neither friends nor allies, right? And so how do you then get the government to change the policy, right? This is, a, even if it's, you're not sitting at a long table with two sides, it's still a negotiation. 
It may happen over months in 17 offices between you know, the US Embassy and then the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or other buildings in the capital. But it's, this is a protracted negotiation. And so when you try to change the, that, the host country's government's mind on whatever the policy, sometimes it's a law that you know, a few years ago, I mean, I'm sure you heard about this, um, Uganda became famous in the news with this um, law, in the, in the call, in we, we shorthanded with anti-gay law, right? Uh, okay, so the first time they tried to pass it, the US Embassy tried to do everything to, to prevent that bill from becoming a law, right? This happens in many countries. They, they'll, uh, a bill will appear in the, in the parliament of that country, and then uh, the American Embassy will decide okay, this, we need to alert the, the Washington because if this bill becomes a law, then we're in trouble. Right? So then the State Department will instruct the embassy to make sure that the bill never becomes a law, right? Kill the bill. Okay, how, you can't kill the bill as the embassy. You need to find people in the system of the host country, whether it's in the parliament or in the executive branch or whatever, right? To do something about that. This is a negotiation, but you don't do it uh, it's very unlikely to be successful if, if you try to get them to do it either as a favor to you or because they're afraid of you. You have to somehow persuade them that not having the bill become a law is in their own interest, right? And so that is, uh, and, and I mentioned empathy because you won't be successful or you are very unlikely to be successful unless you understand where they came from to introduce this bill or this policy in the first place, right? Why are they doing this, right? Why did Putin invade Ukraine, right? I wanna know, not because I agree with him, right? But what was he thinking? Why was, why was his mind, right? What told him that he could just dis, um, extinguish a country with war in the 21st century, right? I'm just... Uh, and I wouldn't mind if I had the opportunity asking him directly. I mean, this is an extreme example, but um, in any situation like this, knowing the, so the mindset, the mentality, hopefully speaking the language of the person or the people you are trying to influence, right? Uh, knowing the history of their country, knowing the baggage they come with, right? knowing what makes them tick. Why do they need this policy or this bill? Maybe you can get them where they need to be without this policy or bill, right? Maybe there's another way to get them there. And if you think of it, maybe they will abandon the bill in question or whatever it is, right? So this is the, absolutely the most difficult thing. And that's why I say that diplomacy skill it has to be acquired somehow. We, none of us is born with these skills, right? And the number, downstairs I was talking about the number of political appointees we have in the US system. I mean, 30% of American ambassadors are political appointees, right? With no experience, previous experience in diplomacy or, or many qualifications to practice diplomacy. Um, so it's really detrimental in the big picture when you don't have professionals practicing diplomacy. Yeah. We're, we're about to come up to time. Uh, so I'd like to take one more question and then also follow up with, some, with, with a question of my own just to bring everything to a close. But can I just, uh, we might go with this gentleman here in, in, in the second row. Thank you very much. My name is Eddie. And I would like to ask a question in line with uh, a news article that was uh, published by a number of news outlets last week, which I'll just read the headline. It says, uh, Trump campaign. Trump campaign accuses UK's Labour Party of election interference, and it further says that um, this came after the British Party's volunteers travelled to the United States to help campaign for Kamala Harris. So, just in line of this, uh, what would be your comment about volunteers coming from the Labour Party in the UK going to help campaign for Kamala Harris, and how does this? impact the diplomatic ties between the US and, and the UK and maybe by extension the EU? Um, it doesn't, it's not, I mean, it's not my area of expertise. Uh, you know, Brits have done this before, Americans have certainly, there were, there, were, there were Americans who helped Tony Blair's campaign back in the 90s. 
Um, so, uh, but this is, this is done at sort of political operative levels. Um, and I don't think, at least when it comes to allied countries, I don't think it, have, it has an impact on diplomacy. It's a, very, it's a very specific area of politics, right? And it has to do entirely with domestic politics. And even if it's done by um, two countries. Um, and I mean, Britain, I mean, Americans look at Britain as the closest there is to a uh, non-foreign country, if I can say that, right? So it, yeah, it, it hasn't been a problem in the past, I don't think it'll be in the future or, or currently. My final question, and this is, um, I know, because I know that we're approaching time, so um, my final question, you speak about the skills that make good diplomats. You spoke about empathy. And what I was hoping that you might just, as your final reflection, as someone who teaches people how to do diplomacy, are, are there fundamental traits or core skills that diplomats need to have? Especially, I know that there are some young diplomats in this room here or that they should try and develop throughout their career. And also, given the extensive number of highly impressive diplomats who you've worked with, such as Madeleine Albright, we didn't get to mention it, but also Bill Burns as well. Is there anyone who you think potentially could provide a model or a template as to what good diplomat, what, what a good diplomat is? You could also say Netflix is the diplomat as well, if you want, but. No. <laughs> How many have you seen the the Netflix series? Only three? Okay, four? Maybe five? Okay. Yeah, that's enough. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, it's, um, I, 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 sorry? Don't spoil it. Don't spoil it? Oh, I haven't seen it. Oh, oh no, spo no, no, I have I try to watch, I tried to, so I started the first episode last year and I, I just couldn't finish it. Um, I forced myself uh, this year in, in March, I was in Cape Town and I was on a treadmill and I forced myself to watch the second one and I couldn't finish it either. So uh, anyway, the, the creator of that show emailed me last a year ago and said that um, she was a fan of my book, America's Other Army. She said, we read your book um, early on in the process and, and referred to it often. And I didn't say this to her, but I wonder if, if she's read my book, why is she writing such completely outlandish storylines? It's just, um, yeah, anyway. Um, so I, I really hope that as many of you as possible will consider diplomacy as a profession, as a, as a career choice because no country has enough diplomats. I don't have the number for Ireland, but I'm sure it's not enough. I do have the number of uh, a starting salary and it's terrible. So, you know, money would not be the reason to become, I suppose, to become a diplomat in Ireland. It's only 38,000 a year, and, and that's at least what their website said when I looked before I left Washington four weeks ago. Uh, hopefully they'll improve that, but it's just not uh, serious, right? It's think that you'll get the best and the brightest based on that kind of salary. Uh, but we need more diplomats, and you, 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 we particularly need, again, professional diplomats, because someone uh, parachuted into diplomacy for a year or two um, is just, um, again, and he just to, see, uh, so to me says that whoever politician made that decision does not value or, uh, or even understand diplomacy fully and what it can do for their own policies to be carried out. Uh, and um, in terms of the skills, so there are skills that none of us is born with. There are skills, so that what I was just talking about with, with aligning, uh, realigning interests and, and with negotiations so that, I, um, I don't think any of us is born with the ability to persuade another country to do something by convincing them that it's in their own interest, right? That's not something that you can, you need, um, you need to be trained to do that, whether formally or by doing it and, and not succeeding and then learning from mistakes. But there are a couple of skill sets that you cannot teach. So I would, uh, the, the mantra in diplomacy for decades, if not longer, has been that you cannot teach diplomacy, that it can only be learned on the job. That's why governments did, never bothered to actually train their people. They just threw them in the, to, into the deep end and hope they'll figure it out. 
That's changing, fortunately, in many countries. And, and they're now realizing that, oh, we should give people training before they go out and represent our country. Uh, but there are a couple of skill sets uh, that, that can, I don't think cannot, can be taught. Uh, and uh, one of them is uh, intellectual curiosity. In journalism, you need to be very curious, naturally, right? I think that's some self, uh, uh, you, you, it's as evident, right? You have to keep asking questions and uh, not be satisfied with the answers you get and, and, so, and so on. Uh, but that applies to diplomacy as well. Uh, particularly if you're posted to another country. If you know, there's a difference, in other words, as a diplomat, you, you work abroad, but you also work in your ministry in the capital. You, you go back and forth. So when you are abroad, you have to keep asking questions. You just have to understand as much as possible about the, the host country. Uh, not only the government, but just the society, because part of your job is to learn how to navigate this society and this country, because if, if something happens, if, if you task with, some, with something by your ambassador or by your ministry, you need to know whom to turn to, who can, who, who can um, resolve your problem or who, who can give you the information you need, right? It's very unlikely you already have the information at your fingertips or you'll have the tools to solve a problem. You will need people in the host country. And that's why you need the, um, the contacts and the relationships already built. So, um, the, 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 in, in, in addition to intellectual curiosity, another skill set that's, that's impossible to teach is judgment. Good judgment, by the way, not bad one, <laughs> judgment. Often we will say in diplomacy, uh, you know, if something happens and you have to resolve it, use your judgment. But uh, senior diplomats tell junior diplomats all the time, when, how, I, how, what should I do about this? And they say, use your judgment, <laughs> right? And that is, uh, uh, one can give examples, maybe in, in, on any given day, you can point to 10 decisions that an, the average diplomat has to make that have to do with judgment. They may be some, something very ti uh, seemingly tiny, but in fact may affect much more than this one person. Uh, and so uh, curiosity, judgment, now there are, um, the rest of them, I think, can be taught. So the, in, the, in the book, uh, we have a, a several, well, about a dozen skill sets. And these two, I think, are probably the only ones that, are, that I, I don't think can be taught. Uh, under, uh, of course, you, you won't be surprised to hear the word communication, because many people say, oh, diplomacy is all about communication. Well, no, it's all about, it's partially about communication. But under communication, um, you have different categories because, um, of course, um, it's writing, right? Everybody knows writing is important, but, but writing in diplomacy is very specific, right? Uh, formal communication with another country is very specific. There are established traditions and literal, literally for, um, official forms of communication like a diplomatic note or a, a demarche or not uh, verbal, uh, with many of these are French uh, terms, of course, from centuries ago. And um, writing a diplomatic cable, for example, writing a memo to your boss with uh, so, uh, what we call action memo, it's you know, a decision to be made, that's, that's very different from any other kind of writing you've seen. It actually comes closer, well, the, the, the diplomatic cable comes much closer to a, germ, a, a, a newspaper story than, than most people realize. Uh, and then listening. There is, uh, the, these are all these skills, uh, uh, writing, listening, uh, public speaking, cross-cultural communication, of course they apply to many other professions, right? But the angle through which you, you're looking at them in diplomacy is very different, very particular, right? I, um, I explained about writing, listening. The, the reason that listening is so vital is not only to receive information. I mean, yes, that's very important, right? So in other words, listening in diplomacy is often more important than talking. So you do need the information, but even more important is using this as a stepped stone to building and cultivating relationships. If you're a good listener and your interlocutor appreciates that, it, it goes a long way. Right, and it also helps in earning their trust, because to be given certain sensitive information that they have to 
trust you um, to do that. Uh, and um, uh, we already talked about negotiation. There are general skills like program man management or people management that, again, sound like, oh, well, this applies to business and this and that, and absolutely true. But you know, have to remember that diplomacy is not just a profession. It's a way of life because of moving around. Right? Every three years or less, you move around, your family moves around, your children have to be plucked out of whatever comfortable environment they may have for school and leave their friends behind and then have to make new friends in the other country and then another and then another. And some children are not good at that. Um, so th your whole life and that of your family is influenced by and affected by your profession. So why is this important for people management? It's because we, when you become a manager in diplomacy or the deputy chief of mission or an ambassador, you're not only responsible for these people in the office, you're responsible for them, period. Meaning that if you have any job, any other job, when you go home at night, your boss doesn't care what you do, right? Well, that is not the case in diplomacy because you live together most of the time, if not in the same building you know, nearby, in, in the American system, it, it's usually live all together. And uh, again, there are exceptions like London. Uh, but often you know, in some embassies, like in Tokyo, there is, a, there is an American uh, embassy housing compound. Everybody, literally everybody lives on the same compound. Uh, even if you don't, you're still a small community. The point is, if your spouse is, uh, is having a drinking problem, or if you're going through a divorce, or if your ch child is not doing well at school, everybody knows it. You cannot hide it. And your boss is concerned about this because if you're worried about your child or your spouse, that affects your job. And it affects the whole section in the embassy and likely more. And if it's a small embassy, it'll affect the whole embassy. So these things are all connected. And managing people in such an environment when all their life is influenced by their work is very different from just the average company or any other business or organization that are concerned only with what you do in the hours you're in the office. So lots to reflect on, especially, especially before you consider your career as a diplomat. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time and for, for, for stopping in Dublin to, to speak to us and to share your insights on the election, uh, on, the, on, on the election and what the, the election next week, the implications it'll have for, for US diplomacy. I'd like, I, was I was hoping that everyone could join me in thanking uh, Nicholas Kralev in the usual way. <laughs>